Brother Cooney, would you come preach for us? What a blessing, amen? amen. That's good, and, and you guys are all part of that. Through your faithful prayers and gifts, amen? amen. Welcome to the pulpit. Thank you. It is a privilege and an honor to be here with you all again, Captain Point. And I do believe it was 2015, because the missions conference has always been in the spring, around the March time frame, correct? Mm -hmm. So it would have been 2015, March time frame. And, um, wow, that's just a few years ago. I'm not going to try to do the math. <laughs> I went to different schools, so I'm not going to try to do that. If you'd open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1. As you're opening up your Bibles, 2 Timothy chapter 1, does anyone have any questions about the country of Portugal, about our ministry there? As we're thinking about those, once again, I'll introduce my family and myself. My name is Josiah DeCunha. My wife, uh, uh, I just blanked on how long we've been there. <laughs> not good. Not long ago. <laughs> Eleven and a half years, Gloria. Our daughter, who is nine, Tirza. Our son, who is seven, Jonathan. And then our twin boys, Silas and Matthias, who are three, turning four in just a few weeks. Amen. And uh, we're sent out by Bible Baptist Church in Victorville, California. We've been in Portugal for the last almost seven years, and it is a privilege to be here with you all. Amen. Any questions about the country of Portugal or the ministry there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is their culture primarily Catholic? Yes, ma'am. Yes, most of them would call themselves Catholic. Um, and as Pastor referred to earlier, they will only attend uh, service at the Catholic Church for Easter, for Christmas, for baby christening, and for First Communion. And that is typically when they... Weddings. And weddings. <laughs> and, weddings. <laughs> and funerals. And funerals, yes. <laughs> and that is when they will most... Uh, typically be there uh, in the Catholic yeah, yeah. Church. Um, with that, though, the vast majority of them, we would call them nominal, but I also tend to call them atheistic Ooh, okay. Catholics. Many of them do not believe a word that the Catholic Church mm -hmm. teaches. Um, and so they are swinging from being very religious toward being very atheistic, humanistic. And our prayer is that we might be able to catch them in the middle of that swing and bring them back to the Bible. The Bible Amen. is the Word of God, Amen. and it is the authority by which we should uh, run and live our ministry. Any other questions concerning Portugal ministry there? Any other questions? Are you guys limited in soul winning in any way? Um, no, not really. Uh, one thing that is not practiced so much there is uh, door knocking. Uh, it's partly because of a European culture where it's not necessarily uh, looked favorably mm -hmm. upon, uh, but I have done it before there, and uh, would like to pick it back up, going door to door. Also, it's because many times, due to two other religious groups who are very proactive in doing <laughs> that, uh, there is a negative viewpoint toward those who are out door knocking. But we can't put the our flyers in their their mailbox, not on the door or the gate, but in the mailbox, unless we have a don't solicitate sticker on it. And so we can do that. What we can also do is we can put up uh, legal size posters outside of apartment buildings unless we have something that says don't put up a poster. And uh, so we can put those up and we've seen a very good uh, return from that, very good feedback. One more quick question, anybody? Is there any kind of persecution for Bible believing people? Um, <clears throat> not direct not direct persecution, no. Um, when you meet them there, for instance, I'm an American, what are you doing here? Why are you living here? This is so awesome. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a missionary, a Baptist missionary. Oh, bye. <laughs> 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 the conversation may continue, but you have seen the blinds in their eyes yeah. close. And so that is kind of how it goes. Uh, in the video, you may not have been able to tell who exactly were the two men that were trained. One of them, it was obvious, that was Diego there in the pulpit. The other one, he was uh, outside of our church, in front of our church sign with his wife, and he was wearing a Puma shirt. And we thank the Lord for both of those two men. Uh, the one with the Puma shirt is George. The one that was behind the pulpit preaching, uh, that was Diego. And we thank the Lord for those two men. 
2 Timothy chapter 1 is where we will be. Let's ask the Lord to bless the preaching of this word, and then let us launch into the preaching thereof. Lord, we thank you for your mercies, for your grace, for your goodness toward us. And we ask, Father, that you would bless the time, that you would guide and direct us, that you'd open up our hearts to receive your word, but not only to hear it, but to do it as well. Lord, we desire to leave here changed and transformed more into your image. We desire to please you, to serve you, to honor you. Lord, please continue to do a marvelous work here and around the world. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. 2 Timothy 1, 13. The Bible said, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. On a side note, the world says that this is love month. Love. Love. And they tell us we can discover love here and there and express it in these ways. True love is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Amen. only from Amen. him can we learn how to express true love. It doesn't matter Amen. what Disney says. They're wrong. The Bible is right. Amen. Love is found in Jesus. That's Continuing right. on. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from thee, of whom are thy jealous and homogeny. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Who is Onesiphorus? He was a preacher from Ephesus, if I remember correctly, and he came to Paul in his time of need, as he was under house arrest, and he ministered unto him there. He encouraged him. He uplifted his spirit, and he served the Lord faithfully. And so, the, so Paul is now praising this man, thanking the Lord for him. Continuing on, verse seventeen. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. What is going on in the book of 2 Timothy? What is going on here? Well, what is happening is that Paul the Apostle is writing a letter of encouragement, of edification, of instruction unto his son of the faith, his protege, he whom he trained and mentored. He's writing that letter to him to encourage him. In my life, I have five male mentors. Five male mentors. One of them is my father, former missionary to Portugal, Anthony de Cunha. Another one is my uncle, Gary Keck, missionary to Papua New Guinea. Another is my cousin's husband, E.J. Johnson, who works at Lancaster Baptist Church on the cleaning staff. He was my boss at college and helped whip me into shape. Another would be my pastor, Pastor Joel Counts of Bible Baptist Church, Victorville, California. And another one would be the Spanish pastor of the same church, Pastor Daniel Solorio of Iglesia Bautista Biblica, the Victor of Hill. And I thank the Lord for these men. And over the last seven years, as I have had different questions about ministry, I have sent them those questions, asking them, what do I do in such and so circumstance? How do I deal with this? One question stands out in mind. I asked my pastor, pastor, this person has come to the church and they have this viewpoint. How do I explain to them that that is not biblical, that that's not right? And his answer was, don't try to. His answer was, Brother Josiah, just preach and teach the Bible. Amen. Amen. Sunday, Wednesday, day in, day out, week in, week out, preach the Bible, Amen. the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. Oh. Not philosophy, not tradition, not preference, but the Bible. Amen. And only the Bible, for it is a two-edged sword that pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And he said, if you just preach and teach the Bible faithfully and clearly explain it, either it's going to pierce their hearts and cause them to realize that what they are believing in, following after, is wrong and unbiblical, 
or they are going to harden their heart and they're going to leave. They're going to realize your church is not for them and they will leave and go find somewhere else. <clears throat> Preach and teach the Bible. And that was his yeah. instruction unto me. And I have attempted to receive that and apply it in our ministry there. And here, Paul is writing point one to give instruction unto Timothy. The instruction. And we find in chapter two, verse one, his first instruction to be strong. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. As Christians, in order to serve the Lord the way he desires us to serve him, we must be strong in him. Before we can do anything else, we must be strong in the Lord. Amen. Otherwise, not a whole lot is going to happen. We will fail if we go in our own power. The strength, the arm of flesh will fail you. We must trust him and be strong in him. And I am reminded of Joshua 1.7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Now, I don't know if all of you noticed this about me, but I am not athletically inclined by any means whatsoever. <laughs> but I do like to run distance. Distance, not sprint. At least short stubby legs don't help me out in dis in sprints. But distance, okay. And my father, who ran cross country in high school, taught me a little bit about running. He ran 30 miles a day, and he taught me, Josiah, when you're running, don't be looking to the side. Josiah, when you're running, don't be looking behind you because you're going to slow yourself down, and you're not going to see what's in front of you, and you might trip and fall. So keep looking in front of you. Keep looking toward the finish line. Amen. Keep looking at the end goal. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. But Amen. how do we keep Amen. our eyes on Jesus? We must keep our eyes on him in this Christian life. Amen. It's a marathon. It's a long distance race. We have to keep our eyes on him. How do we keep our eyes on him? By being in support each and every day. By being Amen. strong in the Lord. We have to open up this word every single day as the treasure that it is. I don't know if you understand. This is a treasure. This is not just something to bring to church and then we get home and we throw it to the side and stays there and gathers dust. This is a treasure. It's not to be stepped on. It's not to be thrown around. It's not to be treated lightly. It's to be treasure. But each day we need to crack it open and say, Lord, work in my heart. Reveal to me my sin. Convict me of my sin. Help me to repent of it. Help me to walk in your ways. Amen. Each and every day, reading his scripture, searching his scripture, studying his scripture, living his scripture. Each and every day. Each and every day, praying and asking him to work in us. And when I say praying, I mean praying, not 30 seconds, not five minutes. Mm -hmm. That hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer, is that a reality of, in our life or is it just a song we sing? It should be a reality in our Amen. life. Amen. Sweet hour of prayer. We ought to take time in prayer. Amen. When I began dating my wife, I learned there's a difference between walking and walking. <laughs> <laughs> They're at college, they taught us. When you walk, you walk with purpose. You're going somewhere. Right. <laughs> Well, when you're dating, you are walking with purpose, but your speed has to be a little bit different. You're <laughs> taking your time as you walk and enjoying the atmosphere and one another. As we're praying, we need to pray Amen. and take our time and sit well in it, prolong that time. As I think, though, about the concept of being strong in the Lord, I'm also reminded of Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through eight. Colossians 2 verses 6 through 8. There in the Bible it says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Would you like to know the deep theological definition of the word walk? It means to live, breathe, eat, and sleep. Live, breathe, eat, and sleep Jesus. Amen. We ought to live, breathe, eat, and sleep him. They're Amen. in Portugal. They live, breathe, eat, and sleep 
football, real football. <laughs> when I'm here, that's real football. When I'm there, American football is real football. But they love it. They'll play soccer. They'll practice soccer. They'll line up the balls, have the goal in front of them, put an orange piece of tarp in a corner, and they'll train for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, kicking that ball at the tarp. And some of them have really good accuracy because of that training. They love it. They live, breathe, eat, and sleep soccer here in the U.S. Basketball, American football, wrestling, hockey, whatever. Basketball, for instance, they'll get that ball card, put it next to the free throw line, and they'll practice their free throws for a half hour, for 45 minutes, for longer, because they live, breathe, eat, and sleep basketball. Are we living, breathing, eating? Sleeping, Jesus. Mm. We ought to. We must. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith as you have been taught. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. We picked up on something there in Portugal. If the Portuguese people have a bit of yard around their house, they will plant a vegetable garden. They'll grow all sorts of things there. Cucumbers, tomatoes. Um, they'll grow... Um, Lots of things, cabbage. <laughs> the Portuguese words are coming up and you know that's not gonna help you all out. <laughs> but you know, we began doing that. To better integrate with the society, with the culture, we began planting a garden. By we, I mean my wife. <laughs> and they twain shall become one flesh, so. <laughs> but we have learned something over those years. If the, if the vegetable plants don't have very good roots, they're not gonna produce good fruit. They're not gonna have strong, healthy fruit that they're bearing, tasty fruit. They're just gonna shrivel up and die. If there's a bunch of rocks in the soil, those rocks will keep the roots from getting the water, the nutrients that they yeah. need. If there's a bunch of weeds around that plant, they're going to steal away the water and the nutrients. But what does that mean for us, Brother Josiah? We need to get the rocks out of our own hearts. Amen. We need Amen. to identify where we are having our heart and heart unto the Lord, where we're saying, no, Lord, not this area of my life. This area is for me and me alone. We need to snatch those rocks up. We need to throw them out of our life, and we need to go forward for him. Amen. What are the weeds in our life? What is distracting away, us away from our service unto the Lord? Our time with the Lord. Amen. I mentioned I'm not athletically inclined. Do you know what I am inclined for? Mario, Mario Kart 64. Amen. <laughs> I look the socks up at all of you at Mario Kart 64, except for maybe past. I don't know. <laughs> I might just like one. <laughs> no. I loved that, and I played it so much when I was a boy. And that's exactly why we agreed, before we even got married, that we would not have a video game system, because 15 minutes becomes two hours like that. Amen. And that distracts the attention away from what really matters. Right. The right. Lord matters. Our service unto Him. Our family matters. Amen. They grow up so fast. It was just yesterday that my nine-year-old was six months old. Amen. And now she's nine going on 19. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies. <clears throat> we need to be rooted in the Lord. Amen. We need to be strong in him. Why? Beware. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The wind of this world will howl. They will lift up their voice and they will rage against you, striving to uproot you, striving to blow you away from the Lord. Amen. To cause you to turn your back upon the Lord. They will blow. The question is, will we be a, a tumbleweed Christian? Mm. Or will we be a sequoia Christian? Amen. Those sequoias are marvelous trees. They stand so tall, so wide. They're humongous. Why are they able to do that? Because of their roots. Amen. The deeper the roots, the wider the roots, the bigger the tree can grow, and the more fruit that it can produce. 
remember that illustration. We will come back to it later on in the service. We need to be strong in the Lord. But in order for that to happen, there must be a personal commitment to walk daily in the Lord. Amen. I can't do it for you. Right. Pastor can't do it for you. Amen. Amen. Mrs. Pastor can't do it for you. Sorry, I know every pastor's wife hates that title. <laughs> Mrs. Pastor. No one else can do it for you. You have to decide. Amen. I'm going to walk in the Lord. But mm -hmm. you can't do it on your own. You have to do it through the Lord's help. Yes. Through the yes. strength that He gives. Yes. And ask Him daily, throughout the day, Lord, please help me to walk in you, to pray without ceasing. So to be strong was the first instruction. The second instruction was to teach. Verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same thing that thou faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. To teach what was heard. What had been heard? What had been heard? Well, if you go to Acts chapter 16, you find that's when Timothy first met Paul. He was at Derby and Lystra, cities in Asia Minor. And there he met Paul. There he heard Paul preaching unto the church family. But then he left and traveled with Paul. In that same chapter, he began traveling with Paul. And he heard Paul one-on-one -on -one teaching the same things. But then at the end of that chapter, Paul gets to Philippi. And he led, leads Lydia the seller of purple unto the Lord. Then there's a demon-possessed slave girl that is following Paul and Paul's team around, mocking the Lord. And finally, Paul turns around and says, be gone from her. Mm -hmm. yeah. And her owners are enraged about this. They have just lost a source of revenue. And so they yeah. demand that Paul and his team be beaten and thrown in prison. <coughs> and the authorities are happy to oblige. And what is Paul doing as he's there in prison? His back is beaten, his back is bruised, his back is bleeding. And what is Paul doing there in prison? Is he, ah, they don't like me, I'm gonna go home. Is he doing that? No, he's singing praises unto Amen. the Lord with his team until midnight. Amen. And Timothy saw this. He saw that Paul lived what he taught. Whether or not any of us like it, we are each of us teaching something. What are we teaching to those around us? What are we teaching? We need to be careful about what we are teaching. Amen. We need to think about what we are teaching. I know of families who have made the decision, oh, if my child's sports time is on a Sunday, like their game is on a Sunday. Well, we're gonna take them to the game because you know mm. they might have a future there, and we want them to you know have a full childhood. And we need to spend time together as a family. Family is the most important. No, the Lord is most important. Right. Right. By the way, people talk about our priorities are God, family, church, like that. They're not separate priorities. They need to be incorporated together, wrapped up in each other. By the way, when we go to church as a family, we're spending time together as a family, Amen. at church, at the house of the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Amen. And what we teach our children when we do that is when it comes to choice, time for a choice between God and something else, well, God understands. God understands. He knows the intentions of my heart. He knows that I love him. Amen. He'll forgive me. It'll be okay. I'm sorry. No. That is not right. Mm -hmm. We choose the Lord always. Amen. Always we must choose the Lord. He Amen. is to be first. He is to be not just prominent or large in our life. He is to be preeminent. That means before everything else. Right? He is to be there. What was heard? What was heard? To teach to faithful men is what the verse says. The same thing that to faithful men faithful to the Lord, to the word, to prayer, to church attendance, to serving in the church. We mentioned George and Diego in the video. I did not just ask them to preach. I didn't just ask anybody in the church family to preach. I asked men who have shown themselves 
faithful to the Lord, to the Word, to prayer, to church attendance, and to church service. I direct your attention to George, for instance. He began attending the church in January of 2020. In February, the end of February 2020, we came back for our first furlough. Poor planning on our, on our yeah. part. Two months into furlough, everything closed down because of COVID. Mm -hmm. But when we got back there, George was still there. Thank George you. was still trying to serve the Lord. And as we began meeting outside the apartment building underneath which we meet, he helped with some of the setup. He helped with some of the teardown. It was, oi, what can I do to help pastor? And so after waiting for a while to see if this would continue, okay, George, could you teach a children's book? What? And he was terrified. But we explained to him how to teach. We gave him church uh, Sunday school curriculum. And the first few weeks, they were rough, yes, but he grew in it. And he got better at it. Amen. And then a year and a half later, George, could you preach? And again, he was petrified. George, don't worry. We'll pray about it together. We'll find the text together. We'll read through the text several times. We'll meet together. I'll teach you how to preach. And he did great his first time preaching. He did wonderful. And he's improved and grown in that. Amen. But he had to start somewhere. Right. He had to start by just being faithful at church, faithful in his Bible reading, in his personal walk with the Lord. Amen. We all of us, each of us, have to start somewhere. Amen. I remember where I started. May 2006, arrived at Bible College, began working through the summer in preparation for my freshman year at Bible College, working as a janitor. That's how I began. And for the first time, I began reading the Bible daily on a regular basis, faithfully. For the first time, I began, to, began spending time in prayer daily. For the first time, I began weekly serving in a weekly ministry. And God began to work in my heart. I began as a simple janitor, vacuuming the floors, cleaning the toilets. Can I tell you, those toilets after Sunday are nasty. <laughs> no amount of money is worth cleaning those toilets. It is a labor of love to the Lord. But he is worthy of it. Amen. And we all have to start somewhere. Where did Paul start from? For he's the one that's writing this letter. He was Saul, the persecutor of the church, the murderer of Christians. And then he got saved. And his life got transformed. And he became arguably the greatest missionary to have ever lived. Praise the Lord. We all have to start somewhere. And we all have to be faithful unto the Lord. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Brother Josiah, I want to serve here in my church. I want to be used. But pastor, he hasn't asked me to do much yet. Hey, you be faithful in what you've been asked to do. First of all, be faithful in your daily walk with the Lord. Second of all, be faithful in your weekly attendance to church. Amen. Every time the church doors are open, be here. Amen. Be here. Be in your seat. And as needs arise, you see something that needs to be taken care of, take care of it. Get involved. He's not going to complain if you help somebody who's just coming to the church and they don't know where to go. Oh, it's right this way. He's not going to complain if there's trash on the floor and you pick it up and throw it in the trash can. He's going to be happy about that. Amen. Get involved. Be faithful to teaching them. To teach what was heard, to faithfulness, to teaching them. It says at the end of the verse, to men who shall be able to teach others also. It's not just enough to lead someone to the Lord. We need to begin explaining to them why they need to follow the Lord and believers' baptism. We need to begin discipling them. But after that, it's not done. We need to continue training them, teaching them, so that they can reach others with the gospel as well, so that they can disciple others as well, so that they can go forth, not for them to follow us, so they can follow Christ right. and continue going. None of us know when our day is up. It Amen. could be tomorrow. It could be 70 years from now. Amen. We don't know. But we need to live each day as if it could be our last. We need to live preparing others to serve the Amen. Lord. As we were there in Portugal this past term, that, that really became true for us. We understood that even more. Why? 
We arrived seven years ago. Since we have arrived, there have been no new American independent fundamental Baptist missionaries to reach the field of Portugal. Since we arrived, there have been four families that have come off the field. We were number 13, by the way, when we arrived. In April, a fifth family will be leaving the field. Of those that remain, the eight that remain, one of them is just in their 80s. I don't expect them to be there for much longer. Two others are in their 60s. Most likely in the next 10 years, they're going to be coming off the field. That leaves us with five missionary families there in the country of Portugal. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've heard from two different young men who believe the Lord is calling them to the country of Portugal. Amen. Amen. But one of them is just finishing up his master's year. The other one is in his junior year uh, at Bible College. They still have to go through, well, one, they both need to finish Bible College, and then they both need to go through deputation. There's no guarantee they're going to make it. Amen. We need more laborers there. We need more laborers. We need to teach others and commit that word unto them. Commit. The verse 2 says commit. That word means to deposit and trust or into the protection of another person. Just recently, my wife and I went on a date, and we were entrusted to care of our kids with two people. Daniel and Emma Salorio, the Spanish pastor and his wife of our singing church. We didn't just ask anybody. We asked somebody that we trusted. And with that, that meant that since we trusted them, we trusted them and we didn't call every five, ten minutes, hey, how are the kids? Are they doing okay? What's the temperature? Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> I have entrusted the care of Igreja Batista Bíblica de Cervantes into the care of George and Diego. And with that, that means I'm not calling them incessantly. Hey, how are you doing? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you spending time in prayer with them? How's your sermon preparation going? Um, how many points have you written? That's too many points. Um, take a few off. That's too few. Add some more. What verses are you using? No, not those ones. You see, if I do that, they're just going to go, forget it. I give up. Mm -hmm. And they're going to walk away. I have to trust them. I have to let them develop on their own. I have to let them make mistakes. Do you know that's one of the hardest things in ministry? You train someone, and you let them get up there and do it, and you go, hmm, I could do it so much better. I sit, keep your mouth shut, let them do it. Let them learn. By the way, there's always going to be a mistake in a church service. I learned that pretty quickly. There's always something that goes wrong in a church service. In our church services, the moment I open up my mouth to leave the music there, a mistake has been <laughs> Always. But we must commit unto others and trust them and let them develop and make mistakes. Does that mean that those mistakes don't have consequences that come with them? No, they have consequences. There must be, hey, that's not the way we do it. We do it this way. Here's why we do that. As a missions intern, there are sending church. For two years, I made mistakes. Two years, I heard, Brother Josiah, my office. Yes, sir. <laughs> and it was right. I needed it. And he was gracious with me, but I needed it. But what's the reason for all of this? What's the reason for all of this? Let's go back to chapter one. Let's go back to chapter one. There was a reason we read those verses. Verse 15 said, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. We read that and we have the sense that they, that they didn't just turn away from Paul, they turned away from the Lord as well. They mm -hmm. left the faith. That doesn't mean they were unsaved. It means that they stopped living for the Lord. They stopped living for the Lord. Many will wander away from God. And many already have. I mentioned those five missionary families. One of them, without going into detail, the husband has completely turned his back on the faith and has mocked the faith. Mm -hmm. He has walked away from it. Many in Portugal are discouraged because of this. What do we do? Do we sit down and cry a river? No. We leave it at the feet of our Lord and we get back up and we keep going. And we train others. The next verse, verse 16. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. 
But when he was in Rome, she sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. Paul is praising this man. But then in the very next breath, he says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul is saying, train someone, train men who will be faithful unto the Lord, men who will be able to serve with you in ministry, men who will encourage you in your service. For Onesiphorus, he came to me there in Rome, and he encouraged me in the Lord. He lifted up my head. He encouraged me. As I read about that, I am reminded of Aaron and her and how they encouraged Moses during the battle of the Amalekites. Yep. In the battle of the Amalekites, whenever Moses' hands were up like this, the Israelites were winning the battle. Whenever his hands began to go down, the Amalekites began to win. Amen. I don't know how many of you have ever held up your arms just like this for a period of time and just left them up there. After a little bit of time, in short order, your arms start to hurt. Amen. If you try to keep pulling you up there, they're going to start shaking and you're not going to be able to keep them up there. What did Aaron and her do? They got rocks and put them on either side of Moses. They sat on those rocks and they helped hold up his arms. Amen. But I imagine that Aaron and her, that their arms began to get tired as well. Maybe they could have used someone who helped hold up their arms. What's my point? If the ministry of Captain's Point Baptist is solely dependent upon pastor and his wife, the church will die. That's right. The church will die. He needs an Aaron. He needs an her alongside of him. By the way, she needs that as well. They're both serving in the ministry. They both are. But alongside of Aaron, he needs someone holding up his arms. And that person needs someone else holding up his arms. And that person needs someone else holding up his arms. And you know what? When we're all there, linking our arms together, we are so much stronger. Amen. We're so much stronger when we serve together. I had the privilege, the dubious privilege, of coaching basketball for our Christian school. I knew nothing about basketball. You two became my best friends the next month. <laughs> I learned something, though. If we try to make the team all about just one player, we're never going to do well. Amen. We're going to be a disaster out there. But if all of the team works together, it doesn't it does matter if they're really bad, <laughs> but not as much if they're all working together as a co cohesive unit. We played varsity. We had maybe eight players on our team when we first started. Two of those were sixth graders that call. We're playing varsity. <clears throat> but can I tell you something? Our first game, I, we played for a while, and then my older, larger kids were getting tired. So I was like, okay. I put them in there. <clears throat> and they started playing. And after a few moments, I yelled out, squirrel. And that was for a specific strategy for those two. Wherever the ball went, both of them followed that ball. And they mobbed whoever had the ball, trying to get the ball away from him. And you know what? They actually took it away from the senior on one of the opposing team. He was standing there and I just looked them like, what just happened? And they had that ball and they took off from the other side. Unfortunately, we didn't score a basket, but we took the ball away. And those two young men, they definitely fouled a lot, but the ref kind of overlooked it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But they worked well together. We need to work together. We need to serve and encourage and support and lift one another up. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus said, The harvest truly is as plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth missionaries, pastors, and evangelists into the harvest. Is that what it says? Amen. No, it says laborers there. Laborers. So far too often we think in those verses that he's talking about missionaries, pastors, and evangelists. No, he's talking about born-again believers. Amen. If you're saved, you're supposed to be in the harvest. Amen. Get in the harvest. Get up off the sidelines. Get in the harvest and serve in some way. Each and every one of us can serve and need to serve. 
Amen. I have a question though. Can you serve in the harvest? If you're not saved, you can't save in, uh, serve in the harvest. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you cannot serve. Amen. The Bible says though that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. God loves each and every single one of us and he sent his son to die for oh. each and every single one of us Amen. To, cut, to pay for our sin with his shed blood. We have but to accept that Amen. offer. Yes. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. What we earn for our sin, even if it's a little white lie, by the way, even a white lie, a white lie is a big, nasty lie. Amen. Every sin, no matter how innocent it may appear, is a big sin, and they all appear the same unto God. Amen. The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. A gift is something that is freely given, no strings attached, and it remains that other person. If I were to offer this right now as a gift unto Pastor's son, it becomes his. He has but to receive them. Yes. Now I'm not giving it to you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> but it's his if I were to give it to him, and it would remain his. It is ours. If we but call upon the Lord our Savior. The Bible tells us we're saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Amen. We can't earn our salvation. Nothing we do will ever get us close enough. Mm -hmm. But why is it that way? Well, one, we can't do it. But two, it says it right there in the verse, lest any man should boast. I like watching the World Cup or the UEFA European Champions League. I like watching that. But can I tell you, there is a player who is one of the best players in the world, but he bothers the snot out of me. His name is Cristiano Ronaldo. Why? Because when he scores a goal, what does he do? He jumps forward and he goes, and first his chest out and he's like, I scored that goal. I did it all, all the work. Forget my teammates here on the field with me and the ones who passed the ball to me and stole the ball from the opposing team. I did it all. Forget my coach, the assistant coaches, the support staff. Hmm. I did it all. And if we believe that salvation is by our work alone, we're saying, I did it, not God. Amen. It's everything he did. His finished work upon the cross. Yes. And how prideful is, of us is it to say, oh, I did it. I can do it. Prideful and wrong. Presumptuous. He is extending a gift unto us. Yes. All we have to do is call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. Will you be praying with us that the Lord will do a, a mighty, an amazing work there? Our goal this next term is to train more men. And to train men, we already have even more. And when I say men, I also mean to train the whole church family. Because the more we train them, the more the church can do. The wider the roots, the deeper the roots. The higher the tree can grow, the larger shadow it will cast. Amen. For those that shelter underneath it, those that are weary, those that are hurting, this is to be a hospital unto the wounded soul, mm -hmm. is it not? Amen. Amen. The more fruit it will bear. By the way, fruit's not supposed to stay in the tree. It's supposed to fall to the ground and plant seed and grow another tree. Amen. We're going to prayerfully be able to start another Bible study that could prayerfully become another church plant. But what about you, Captain? Are you going to sink your roots, spread your roots? Are each of you going to seek to grow in the Word, in the Lord, so that you can be put in even more and served in even more here, so that more souls can be reached here in your area of the world? 
let's grow in the Lord. And let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, for your holiness, and your mercy. Thank you for what you have done in our lives.